Chairman, for your kind remarks. I'm always fearful when people start talking about my background. They may come out with that hidden agenda of the League of Rights, which Senator Boswell mentioned, and some of those other scurrilous activities in which the League allegedly participates. But you've been very kind tonight, and I thank you very much indeed. I'd like to start by saying I've just been to North Queensland and I must say that there we've got one of the battle lines concerning the future of Australia. But the great tragedy is that large numbers of quite de desperate people concerned with the threat to their livelihoods and much else have great difficulty in getting their minds around the fact that this is part of some total program. And I want to start by saying that I have the greatest sympathy with those people who find it difficult to believe there is some type of planned program. I was being interviewed this morning by a media representative and that was the one question. Uh, the suggestion that uh, anybody that believes is what's called a conspiracy is just a little bit, you know, touched. And I'm sympathetic with those who have some problem about that, and I think perhaps the best thing to do is to look at that word conspiracy. It's very emotional to many people, but really the meaning of conspiracy is as old as man. We can go right back to, shall we say, uh, Julius Caesar. There was a conspiracy to pull him down. There was a chap called Alexander the Great who believed that if the whole world was run by one man, it would be a much better place. And he set about trying to achieve that. We recently saw in our sordid party political sphere another manifestation of conspiracy when uh, a man called John Howard suddenly discovered that those he'd invited to have dinner with him were in essence doing something quite different. That's conspiracy. Conspiracy is a situation where a man or a group of men do come together to achieve a common purpose. And if they don't publicly announce what they're about, well then of course it's a secret type of conspiracy. But the conspiracy I'm talking about tonight is an open conspiracy. And no one can dispute it because you've been told all about it and you can see it unfolding before your eyes today. The planned surrender of Australia. So perhaps we might start by plunging right in by raising a question called the New International Economic Order. Sorry. Now, if you listen to the critics of the League, of course, that's just simply a product of... Uh, Eric Butler or his colleagues' overheated imagination. The idea there's any sort of a program like that is too silly for words. Well, let us look just at hard facts. Let us first start with the Australian Labor Party's own platform. And in that Australian Labor Party platform, you can read in black and white that that particular political party is pledged to incorporate Australia into the new international economic order, which means, in essence, that our total economy must be incorporated into a global economy. And if you are following this and can understand the double talk, you'd be listening to Senator Button. Senator Button keeps telling you we've got to restructure the Australian economy, both primary industry and secondary industry. That's one of the new buzzwords, restructuring. What does that mean? It means progressively phasing out some sections of our economy, amalgamating other parts of our economy to fit it into an international order. That's what it's all about. So it's no secret as far as the Labor Party is concerned. There it is in their platform. Well, of course, at that stage, the dedicated party devotees immediately say, well, that's horrible, that's terrible. They are engaged in the program of surrendering part of our sovereignty. We must get rid of them. We must bring in the opposition. Now, there's only one problem about that, my friends. There is no opposition. 
Because, you see, I don't care whether you speak about Mr. John Howard or you speak about Mr. Peacock, they're all dedicated to the same program and have said so. And if you've forgotten, I must remind you that for seven years, up and down this country, a man who many people believe was a conservative Prime Minister, Mr. Malcolm Fraser, preached the virtues of the new international economic order. He didn't exactly call it that. He spoke about something called the North-South Dialogue. But translated into English, that meant that Australian economy must be restructured to fit it in to the new international economic order. Well, you can go back a little further, and of course, formally you might say this part of the program really emerged in the open back in 1974. In 1974, Dr. Henry Kissinger, that high-powered spokesman, for those groups we'll look at it a little later, who really exercise power in this world, the great international banking groups, he gave a tremendous address, a keynote address of that holy of holies called the United Nations. And in essence, what Dr. Kissinger was, said was this. The problems of the world now are so great, the problems of all the nations of the world are so great, that no individual nation can solve these problems on its own anymore. What we've got to do is to internationalise the program. In other words, if you can't solve a problem on a small scale, the thinking is if you make it big enough, in essence, you'll find a solution, which is quite a strange way of looking at a problem which to me is rather like saying to the alcoholic, there's only one solution, increase the consumption of alcohol and you'll eventually get somewhere. Now that address was given and the United Nations formally agreed. All members voted for it. The Australian representative put his hand up. What about the Soviet Union? They voted for it. In fact, the Soviet Union said in essence, this idea had been thought of a long time earlier by a chap called Lenin. He actually, they said, was the father of the idea. All that the rest of the world was doing was catching up now. What about that country very much in the news at the moment? Communist China. They're all saved for the new international economic order. So you see, there is a program. You can look, for example, at great international bodies like the Trilateral Commission. Now, the Trilateral Commission is a three major groups headed currently by David Rockefeller, the great Chase Manhattan Banking Group. And they are pledged to advance the cause of the new international economic order, which in essence is that we internationalise the economies of the world. And Lenin was correct when he said you can't create a world state unless you first of all got a world economy. That's the foundation. You must destroy the economic independence of all the member states of the United Nations before you can establish the world state. And they're quite right when they say that. So the new international economic order can be studied and read. The great tragedy about it, of course, you, you'll often find politicians who will assure you, like Senator Boswell and others, that it's all a figment of Eric Butler or someone else's imagination. There's no such program which in essence seems to mean that we're all going the one direction just by bad luck or chance. There's no program behind it. The truth is there is a program. And we shouldn't be surprised about that program. Because what we're discussing, ladies and gentlemen, is an idea as old as man. And so tonight I want to take you back a little in history. I want to cover quickly in a broad sweep some of the aspects we've got to get our minds around. And so we've got to start with what I call a few absolutes. One of the absolutes concerns the subject of power. Now ever since there have been human beings on this world, some of them wanted power. They still want power. You see it every day. The will to power. That's as old as man, starting, as I said, with Alexander the Great, right up to the Soviet Union, other groups wanting power. Now, the absolute power is, of course, the one that we're warned about by the great Lord Acton when he said that all power tends to corrupt, and absolute power corrupts absolutely. That, that is an absolute. 
Now, it's not very fashionable today to talk about absolutes. So I must make it quite clear here, ladies and gentlemen, I believe in absolutes. I believe that two and two still equals four. I believe there are absolute natural laws, and I'm going to discuss them. You can't change them, you can't alter them, but if you're sensible and got enough humility, you can discover them, and then much better still, you can obey them. I suppose one absolute we might give as an example is the law of gravity. That's an absolute. You mightn't like it. You might say it's inconvenient. You might even be one of these highly educated people who on the blackboard can prove it doesn't exist. But I don't care how educated you are, and I don't care what you believe, and I don't care whether you're rich, I don't care whether you're poor, I don't care whether you're good or whether you're bad. But if you jump over the cliff, you'll always get the same result. That is an absolute. Now, there's a very wise English poet, some of you would be familiar with him, the late G.K. Cheston. Sometimes poets have a sort of a way of putting a truth that's very profound. And Cheston was discussing this and said, you know, the man that jumps over the cliff he not only violates that absolute called the law of gravity, he demonstrates the truth of the law. Well, that's a very profound remark. And paradoxical though it may seem, and I keep stressing this because I believe it's terribly important, ladies and gentlemen. Paradoxical, though it seems, the very plight of the world to me is the great hope of the world. Because you see, the plight of the world is a manifestation we are violating absolutes. If there were no absolutes to violate, there'd be nowhere to go, would there? You can put in whatever language you like. The great Alexander Solzhenitsyn put it in simple Christian language when he said, we've forgotten that absolute we call God. And until we go back to that absolute, there's no way out. But there is a way out as long as we accept the fact as an absolute. That means we've got to change our thinking. We've got to have a different approach. And you can move on to these other absolutes, the absolute about power, which as Acton said, always tends to corrupt. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. But the idealist says, well, it ought not to corrupt. There ought to be good men that can handle power. Well, I'm not here to preach tonight, but I'd just like to point out to you that the greatest temptation offered to him who at least the Christian believe was the Son of God was power, the temptation in the wilderness on the mountain. The temptation was world dominion. That was the way to achieve the kingdom. And Christ rejected it. And I never cease to be amazed by people who still call themselves Christians who will agree that he whom they, I hope, still believes the Son of God, he accept, rejected power, and yet they seem to believe that ordinary mortal human beings can be trusted with it. The truth is that no individual can be trusted with excessive power. In other words, the only safe place for all power is in the hands of the many. Decentralized power, with every individual personally responsible for the power he uses. Not as we are getting today in our highly centralized society where power is used by individuals in different fields, political, economic, and financial, and they are not personally responsible for that power. I suppose an example of what I'm talking about is David Rockefeller. Now, David Rockefeller, back in the 70s, established the Chase Manhattan Bank at a time when Mao Zedong was leading what today is called Communist China. And he went back to the United States and he wrote a most remarkable article. It wasn't a comment off the cuff. And he said that what's taking place in Communist China is the most constructive revolution of the last 2,000 years. He said this is a tremendous step forward in the history of man. And here was Rockefeller using power no man should have through finance to modernize China. 
It'd be very instructive to hear from Mr Rockefeller right at this moment. Does he regard what's taken place as a manifestation of one of the greatest achievements of the last 2,000 years? We shouldn't be surprised what's happening in China. It is the manifestation of power. Power. And the men have got power are so corrupted, they're not going to relinquish that power. They're even going to use naked force. And with modern technology, they can do that. And the great tragedy is that the damage has to be done. We have to see this before some of our so-called intellectuals will at least humble themselves to admit this is the problem. And so I'm always a man that's looking for some bright lights in the situation. Perhaps you missed this last Saturday. One of the most remarkable articles I've ever read. An article by a man who said Eric Butler's the most dangerous man in Australia a couple of years ago. His name is Philip Adams. Read his article. Philip Adams now says, we've got to admit, we're all suffering from delusions. And he spelled it out publicly. The same man, I might say, of course, for one time, was a great supporter of the Soviet Union until, of course, the Hungarian uprising. And that shook him a little. He moved then to the Fabians. But now he's shifted a bit more because, you see, there's the manifestation, the end of the result of power. And so this question's got to be examined. And it applies to everyone, whoever he may be. Power. The whole of history can be written around it. And linked with that, of course, is another absolute, and that's the one that we've got to direct a lot of attention to at the moment, about government. We're having a lot of discussion about government being debated. What are we talking about? What is government? What's it all about? The absolute about government was enunciated by one of Acton's great contemporaries, Lord Bryce, in the great classic, Modern Democracies. Now Bryce said this, it is the natural tendency of all governments to increase their own power. That's as absolute as the law of gravity. It's no good saying they ought not to do it. The reality is they do it. And ever since men have been trying to govern themselves, <coughs> therefore they've been grappling with this problem. As social beings, we live together. We must live together. We must have some form of government. But how do we take action or how do we have some sort of a program that ensures that government of its nature doesn't take more and more power until government becomes a monster? How do you deal with that? Well, let's go back again. Let's have a quick look at history. Let's start with the Greeks, to whom we owe so much. We owe the Greeks, to the Greeks, the word democracy. Now, that's tossed around every day. You're reading about a democracy. Whether it's dead or buried, they're talking about in China. But what about here? Democracy, well, what is it? Well, democracy is derived from the Greek, demos, the people. The will of the people. But someone says, but we're all voting, Mr. Butler. Surely if people are voting, there's democracy. Voting's not of itself democracy. Voting's a means whereby you might or you might not get democracy. You see, they vote in the Soviet Union. They even have a vote in communist China. That's hardly democracy. No, democracy only exists when the will of the people prevails. So I've no hesitation in saying, as I've been saying to dozens of meetings, Throughout Australia recently, there's very little democracy in this country at the moment. And we can easily test it. And I've been putting a little questionnaire to all meetings. Perhaps we might repeat it here tonight with your permission, Mr Chairman. Let's have a little vote, a real vote. Let's start with one that's very prominent at the moment in your minds. Interest rates. So all those in favour of the present interest rates put their hands up. No one's in favour of that. We did meet one learned young chap, I suspect he was an economic student up at one meeting. He was in favour the other night, but he's a hopeless minority. So no one's in favour of that. But you're going to get it, you might even get higher interest rates if the witch doctors, as I call them, the economic experts, decide it's going to be good for you. You've got to take your medicine. Well, what about high taxation? All those in favour of the present level of taxation put their hands up. No one's in favour of that either. Isn't that surprising? You can run through all the other issues. <clears throat> Immigration, all those in favour of that. 
And you discoveries you go through all the basic issues, the great majority are not in favour of any of these policies, which means the will of the people is not prevailing at all. So why do we talk about democracy? Now, we've got the instruments whereby we might get democracy, but that's a subject we'll discuss a little later. But clearly at the moment we haven't got democracy. And yet we talk about it. Well, now, what did the Greeks discover about the subject? The Greeks discovered some absolutes. <clears throat> now, number one, they discover this. If you're going to have representative government, the first basic requirement is that all the people to be represented must be basically the same kind of people. They must be basically homogeneous. That's number one requirement. The second requirement is they all share the same value system. The same religion, call it what you like. That's the second requirement. And the third requirement, if you're going to have genuine representative government, is that the elected representative must be physically close enough to the elected that the elector can almost reach out physically and shake him by the throat if he's not doing what the representative should be doing for the elector. In other words, the government must be close to the people. And so the Greeks evolved the system of the small city-states. Local government. These are absolutes and therefore it is an also an absolute, the further you take government away from the people, the less control you have over that government. And again, I never cease to be amazed by people in one breath who <coughs> will tell you they're having great problem controlling their local municipality, but in the next breath will tell you, look, the only solution to the world's problems is a world government. If you could establish such a government, which I'll explain we won't, in spite of how much we try, if you could, you'd have the ultimate in world tyranny, even though you call it government. So government is like fire, a good servant, but a terrible master. And the Greeks discovered that. The Greek philosophers, of course, grappled with this problem of the individual, of subject like freedom and rights, and how do you protect it? You can read them all, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, and all the rest, and they were tremendous figures. But no one came up with any satisfactory answer to this question. We're discussing power and how we're going to prevent power being used to really destroy the individual. And no answer was ever provided until we come to the Christian era. Now again, as I've often said to meetings, you can all rest easy, you're not going to get a sermon. <clears throat> I'm not a very preachy, preachy type. I'm merely speaking now from an historical point of view, the history of ideas and the ideas that have been undergirding that civilization we call Western and produced the institutions which we take for granted, but those ideas have undergirded that development. So we've got to look at those ideas. I'm not looking at any other aspect tonight. So number one, a, a shattering idea at that time. And that idea was that every individual counted, ev everybody counted. Every individual was unique. Every individual partook of God. Even the prostitutes counted. The rich and the poor, everybody counted. That was an absolutely blinding concept at that time. The kingdom of God was within every individual and he or she could search for it and seek to find it. What a revelation. And even more so, the individual is born to be free. The truth shall make you free. Freedom was a highly desirable state of affairs for that unique individual. And because of that, obviously then, the group exists to serve the individual. The individual doesn't exist to be manipulated by those who control the group. And it brought the whole question to a great climax with Christ's answer that attack by the Pharisees about doing good works on the Sabbath. And the answer, amazing. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. In other words, institutions exist to serve that rare individual called the individual. The state exists to serve the individual. 
And it's not surprising the Pharisees had only one answer to that. They said, crucify. We can't tolerate that idea. I'm terribly sorry to tell you the Pharisaical ideas come back. Very strong today. We'll look at the way it's come back. History's been perverted. These are ideas that we need to get our minds around because then the next question, if individuals are all precious, born to be free, institutions just to serve them, then how are we going to regulate the associations between people? How are we going to do that? And we're introduced to another blinding truth. You should love one another. That's not a piece of sloppy sentimentalism. That's a law that partakes of truth. Because if you do truly love one another, you do love your neighbour as yourself, and you both respect and love the same absolute, then your relations one with the other are changed dramatically. And you don't need a whole host of written laws, regulations, decrees, all written down as the Pharisees, we now had a new law that proceeded virtually from the hearts of men. And if you'll think about that, if that law is accepted by everyone, you transform your society. You'd hardly need in a society where that law is really accepted, you'd hardly need a police force. And I regret to say that large numbers of Christians, I don't think, have even come to grips with that. Now, if we're going to see that law and those truths undergirded the growth of our civilization, and there was a time when at least they were affected or affected as more than they do today. Some of you are old enough to recall when you could leave your car unlocked, you could leave your house unlocked, because your neighbors, your fellows, did love one another to the extent you respected one another's property. There was a time when your wife and your daughters and your kids could walk on the streets quite free because we had a different society with a different set of values, didn't we? And some of you may even recall what now seems like a golden age when you could do business on a different basis. You could finish a deal with your friend or a man with a shake of the hand. A man's word was his bond. You see, these were all manifestations of that Christian idea. Well, that's all been perverted and today. You're told don't trust anybody. You're back with the Pharisees, write it all down, have all the regulations. In fact, you're told they don't even get married unless you've got a good written contract with all the financial aspects all worked out. So you see, that idea transformed our civilization. And one other idea before we quickly proceed, that answer, another amazing answer, tricky question by the Pharisees about the Roman court. And Christ's answer, well, yes, we need government, we need Caesar. So render unto Caesar that which belongs to Caesar. But, but, don't let render so much unto Caesar there's nothing left to render unto God. And in the famous words of Lord Acton, in that one statement, Christ, just from a philosophical point of view, solved the problem that baffled all the Greek philosophers. Because you see, in essence, what he said was, government is part of the natural order, we need government, but there must be a limit to government. And government exists to serve the individual. Governments belong to the individual. Individuals don't belong to governments. And government itself, Caesar himself, must be under a higher law. Well, that was a bit too much for the Romans. They didn't persecute the early Christians because of a new religion. There were dozens of new religions. The Romans were very tolerant about religion. But here was a religion which said that even Caesar must be subordinate to these truths, these absolute, And that was intolerable, because you see, we got back to the power game. These are the ideas, my friends, that produced a civilization that's unique in the history of man. And like all the great Eastern religions, which are religions of pessimism, Christianity was a religion of hope, creativeness. Man could now participate because of free will and a great drama. And away that tremendous story proceeded. Yes, you can look at all the black parts, but overall, slowly but surely, men learn to live together in a different way and their attitude towards governments change. 
Beyond doubt, the people of that little country called England seem to grasp these ideas a little more deeply than most people and so, for example, they developed a system of law which today we talk about but how many people know where it came from? It's called English common law. English common law, like, unlike other systems of law, is a unique contribution to the growth of civilization. It is a manifestation of the Christian idea. In essence, every individual is so precious, he's so valuable, that no individual can be tried, he must be assumed to be innocent until he is proved guilty in a court of law by his peers. English common law. That's the very foundation of what amount of sanity we've still got left in this country. It's being attacked every day and undermined. The common law. We come up, of course, to the, the great Magna Carta. The state, someone says, well, rather crude language, what the hell's Magna Carta got to do with me in 1989? Well, if that same individual finds himself arrested, by the gendarmes and thrown into jail, he'll soon discover it's got a lot to do with him because his lawyer, if he knows his business, will appeal to something called habeas corpus. And where did that originate? That's in Magna Carta, it's simply Latin, which in essence says you can't put people in jail, hold them indefinitely, you must bring them into a public court and make public charges against them. The body must be produced. So he's discovered that Magna Carta's got a lot to do with him because the whole of our system of law is based on it. Magna Carta is simply a Christian document. And that's the document upon which particularly the English-speaking world has developed, including the Americans. Now, we in Australia have inherited all the developments that flowed along that stream of history. So in essence, when Arthur Phillips arrived down here in Botany Bay with 11 ships, he didn't find all this lying around the beach say this is a remarkable discovery it was all brought here it was developed here by the men and women who pioneered this country and they're all inspired by these ideas you know we talk about the great Australian ethos called mateship you know mateship is simply a manifestation at a very practical level of the law of love that's what it means mateship you do love your neighbour as yourself and I've met many men that couldn't quote the Ten Commandments but that they've lived in accordance with that concept, the law of love. We then go on, of course, to look briefly at what we've done in this country and we've got to understand this as we come to this subject, the planned surrender of Australia. Our forebears, first of all, they developed this iron common with six mini nations. I think that's very important, ladies and gentlemen, to recall that. Because if you believe the Paul Keatings and Bob Hawks and all the rest, you might come to the conclusion that the only wisdom in this country flows out of Canberra. Well, let me tell you, long before Canberra was even known, I don't think it was even a sheep paddock, we had government in this country representing people who were living in accordance with these attributes, and they had developed six mini-nations. Modelled on the British example. Lower houses, upper house, the Czech lower house, and the crown, which is a Christian institution, the common law. All the great developmental work of this country had been undertaken long before we'd heard of Canberra. Many of the harbors have been developed, roads, railways were being produced. The only buildings in the capital cities that are worth looking at, if Mr Bond or some of his friends haven't knocked them down, are those built before Federation. They've got some character to them. We overlook all this. Well, now, logically and naturally, if the idea developed, the same kind of people on the fifth continent, Australia is the fifth continent of the world, six mini-nations, can't we get the benefits of those mini-nations cooperating in some sort of a, a system? And so the idea developed some sort of a federal system of government. Now, if you'll read the great debates of last century, the thing that must strike you as you read through it all, those men, compared with what you've got today, these little political pygmies strutting around, these men are absolute giants. 
Read what Parks or Deacon or Barton. You see, these men were steeped in the lessons of history about government and power. And so the great question was, well, how are we going to have a government that will serve the states without the nature of that government being such, it'll take more and more power, it could finish as a monster and devour us. That was the great issue. How were you going to get the people of Queensland to join a system of government along with Tasmanian, South Australians and Western Australians and all those small states could be outvoted perhaps by one city? They weren't going to vote for that. So you see the result of that was the development of a system of government based on the British system. A lower house, right, we'll have a house of representatives, but we will have an upper house of review, which if you don't know was originally called the state's house, called the Senate. And because the Federation is an association of sovereign states, there won't be any nonsense about one man, one vote, one value. Every state is entitled to equal representation in that part of the system. And so in the Senate, as you all know, the people of Tasmania have as many representatives as the people of New South Wales. And we re really should thank our forebears for their tremendous wisdom. Otherwise, if we hadn't the Senate and the checks and balances it's had on government, this country would be in an even worse mess than it is today, the Senate. Then, of course, they said, all right, we've got to give the people a say. If you're going to change the rules, so if you look at the Constitution, we'll have a referendum. I want to stress that because you've got a lot of people today as we come to what we're talking about later, about having referendums. That's some newfangled idea. It's not. It's an old idea. It's part of our constitutional development. The people must be consulted. Well, away we went, and it wasn't long before the worst fears of some was, were really manifesting themselves, and all governments up at Canberra got that itch. That's the nature of government, particularly central government. A little more power. Not too much for a start, but just a little bit. Generally because they want to do good. I want to stress this, you know, because many people get fooled by this whole question of power. And they say, yes, but this group here, they're well-meaning. They are pleasant people. You know, they are very intelligent people. Some of them are very well-educated. They rather like the do-gooder. No, the do-gooder is a very pleasant person, I generally find. You know, the do-gooder is just that person that wants to do good to you, whether you want it done to you or not. And then you see, he just wants enough power so he can do good to you. It might be just so he can fluoridate the public water supply or do some of these other things. But you see, when he takes the first step, he starts to corrupt himself. And the end result is predictable. You can predict what's going to happen. Power. And so away we went. But fortunately, any major changes in the power structure in this country had to be brought back to the people. And so every time it came back to the people in the main, the people at referendum said no. And that was the position right up until the Second World War. Now, as we entered the Second World War, we had a remarkable man here, an attorney general by the name of Dr. Revett. And I just want to say this without going into any detail, that Dr. Rebbitt was a very able man, a very clever man. Nothing wrong with his brain power. But he had a certain idea about power. And he genuinely believed if he and his colleagues up at Canberra had it, after the Second World War was finished and all the service would come back, we'd have some sort of a utopia we could create here. But his big problem was, he tried to stampede the people. Now, why did Bert Ebert have that idea? Well, you see, Bert Ebert, Dr. Ebert, belonged to that movement called the Fabian Socialist Movement. Now, if you will take notice of what the Ron Boswells and all these other people are saying, you see, the Fabian business is, is not a serious business. It's just perhaps a few academics having a little chat now and then and this wretched League of Rights is trying to elevate it to some sort of a great menace. What is the Fabian Society? Well, we don't need to go beyond one outstanding authority on the subject, namely your own Prime Minister, Prime Minister Bob Hawke. He's a member of it, 
but he's done more than be a member of it, he's told you what it's all about. So let's just look at that little incident. It's important in this program of surrendering control of Australia. You will recall back in 1983 how Bob Hawke came to office. Quite a dramatic development. Bill Hayden, he felt even the drover's dog could win, but he was pushed aside. And this new pop star was brought on the stage. And he was elected. Well, a remarkable number of things happened. First of all, the great drought broke and people said, there you are, this chap's different. Then we won the America Cup. And he was at every cricket match, every tennis match, where everybody was winning, there was Bob Hawke on the front pages everywhere. Played cricket with the kids, or well, we'll call one example, where he got a black eye, and that was on the front pages. This was Bob Hawke. You almost thought he might start to walk on water any minute. Now, in 1984, in the midst of all this tremendous publicity, your Prime Minister gave a quite historic address in Melbourne at a dinner. It's not quite clear how many were there, but at least figures vary from 1,000 up to 2,000. But what we do know is that some of the most prominent of your fellow Australians were all that dinner, ranging from High Court judges, Supreme Court judges, academics, newspaper men, all there. Now, what was the dinner about? It was to commemorate the founding of the Fabian Social Society way back in 1884, when a group of Marxists decided the English-speaking world would never accept the drive for power along the Bolshevik Road, you have to have another program. And the Sydney Webbs and all the rest devised that program. They've told you all about it. You can read that old cynic George Bernard Shaw of how we joined all the political parties, including the Conservative Party. And it wasn't long, they're all putting forward ideas that would never have come into our heads if we hadn't put them in. It's all there. But you see, Senator Biles and these other politicians, it, it's all a myth of our, figment of our imagination. Well now, this address by Mr. Hawke outlined the roots of his thinking, where his ideas come from, the role of the favourite, but even more important, where he was going to take this country. He spelled it all out. And when you tell people about that address, I well understand those who say, well, that's, that's just astonishing, because I, I don't recall even seeing that on the back page. Still, that's on the front page, eh? and of course you didn't, because the media which had been putting this pop star up there on every other issue, for some reason, this wasn't rated newsworthy. Made about three lines in the Sydney Morning Herald and a couple in the Advertiser, and that was that. In other words, the media of this country didn't think that was newsworthy, and that's an interesting situation itself. But what happened is rather interesting. And I've got to confess this, I must confess this, that one of those supporters of that wretched League of Rights, a lady, wrote a very coy letter to the Prime Minister's secretary. And she said she'd always been interested, which was truthful, in Mr. Bob Hawke and his activities, and she'd just seen a brief reference to this address, and she was quite sure it would contain some of the usual in-depth and comments that we'd expect from Mr Hawke. Would it be too much if she could get a copy? And that private secretary was so delighted that someone be interested enough, he shot it to her. And then a dreadful thing happened, that League of Rights got hold of it and started to strip it all over Australia. You can read it there on the table tonight if you haven't got a copy. There's no secret about it anymore. I don't know if that secretary got the sack about it. But you see, according to the critics of the League, this doesn't exist. I am not aware of one member of the opposition that got up in Parliament and used that address to belt Bob Hawke around the ears. No, completely quiet about it. Why? Well, you might be aligned with that dreadful League of Rights because they've been talking about this for a long time. That's the Fabian movement. Bert Evatt belonged to it. He's a close friend of one of the doyens of that movement, Dr. Harold Lasky of the notorious London School of Economics. And Bert Evatt felt the need for power. Well, he couldn't get the people stampeded enough to hand the power over, so we had to have the 1944 referendum in this country. And the Australian people again said no. Overwhelming no. There was only one group who said yes. That was my group. Not me, but my group, 
the servicemen. Wherever they were serving, it was interesting this, you might just remember this, whether they were serving in Europe, in the Middle East or in New Guinea, in the main they voted yes. But why would they vote yes when all the population at home were voting no? Well, they were dependent for most of their information about political matters on an organisation called Army Education. And some very interesting people used to run that. There was a young lieutenant by the name of Dr Jim Cairns. Now, you must have heard of him. To put it quite bluntly, the Fabians, the Marxers, ran it. So the troops were saturated with that sort of thinking, which indicates something you might think about if you got complete control of the media and only put one view, you might get the result that you want. Bert Everett was upset and that stage then a new development started to take place. No argument about that. It was quite clear if you're going to have a say for the Australian people, they were always going to vote no. Now at that moment, this idea that I want you to get your minds around started to develop because our future depends upon understanding. And in essence they said, well, we're going to find some way we can change the power st structure without consulting the people. They looked at the external affairs, that's section 51, just those two words. Now the framers of the Constitution never ever visualised this would come about. They saw the external powers naturally belonging to the federal government for simply arranging association with other members of the British world and other nations, that's all. But now, said Bert Everett and those around him, we can use that we can start to develop international agreements. That's constitutional. This holy of holies called the United Nations is emerging. We can sign conventions with that. And then we can argue, because we've signed a convention, we've signed an international agreement, therefore we are required to legislate for the whole of Australia to give effect to that agreement, even if it means overriding the states and the constitution. Now, I well recall shortly after the Second World War giving lectures about this because I'd been studying these matters ever since I was a boy at school and trying to warn my fellows about it. And I well recall, of course, the reaction one got at that time. And I well recall a couple of people saying, in essence, poor old Eric, bit troppo, up in the islands too long, seeing them under the bed. I mean, he's trying to tell us now we're going to reach the stage we won't have a say in the constitution there says in black and white we must be consulted. Have another drink, you know. Gee, Jake, mate. Well, you see, Fabian is a movement of gradualness. It's like my little story about the frog. If you haven't heard it, I'll tell you and the others forgive me. Take a frog, a nice, live, healthy frog. You toss that frog into boiling water, and as soon as he gets that boiling water, his reflex results in an attempt to jump to safety. But if you put the same frog in cold water, and then just slowly increase the temperature, all the frog does is keep adjusting. As long as you don't overdo it, slowly but surely keeps swimming around, and you know eventually you can boil him alive. Where the frog. And the temperature's been progressively increased. Those who are old enough will agree with me that we're accepting things in this country which 50 years ago would have produced a revolution. We're like the frog, we've been convinced. That's Fabianism, slowly but surely. Until eventually, in the year 1982, the first warning signs emerged. Quite open, you couldn't argue. It's a piece of legislation brought down by the Commonwealth about Aboriginal affairs. Won't go into it. Your state government said, just a minute, you can't do that. That's contrary to the Constitution. They held up the Constitution. We'll go to the High Court. And they went to the High Court. It's called the Kuwata case. <clears throat> and what did the High Court say? By a majority, admittedly a majority, but it was a majority of four to three, they said because an international convention had been signed, the Commonwealth could do what it liked. And the dominant member of the majority was a very interesting man by the name of Mr. Lionel Murphy. Mr. Lionel Murphy was one of the guests at that famous dinner in Sydney, in Melbourne, a long-term failure. 
And I might just say this, if ever there was a man that typifies that famous Shakespearean observation that the evil that men do lives after them, the goods often turn to their bones, it was Lionel Murphy. This is the impact of ideas, my friend. And then the next year, of course, Mr Hawke had his election. And during that election, he said, now, if we're elected, those carriages down there in Tasmania that want to build a dam, that's going to be stopped. And as soon as he was elected, they took steps to make it clear to the Tasmanians no dams are going to be built down there without their permission. In fact, Senator Evans, just to make the message clear, did something that had never been done in this country before. He sent an RAF plane down there, fired to flow over the top of them. It didn't go down too well for the Tasmanians. Although he did say later he thought it was a good idea at the time. But the Tasmanians said, you can't do this to us. You see, they took out the constitutions and they looked at section 100 and said, black and white, we've got control of rivers and waterways. You can't do this to us. The High Court ruled again, four to three. Sorry, there's a convention, this time a United Nations convention. A part of Tasmania has been put under something called the World Heritage Commission. And because it's been put under the World Heritage Commission, that part of Australia has been surrendered and the Commonwealth can say what's going to be done and what can't be done. And if you'll get your mind around that, ladies and gentlemen, do you realise now, with this development, all that the Commonwealth's got to do is to keep allocating different parts of Australia for listing under the World Heritage Commission, which is administered by the United Nations Educational and Cultural Organisation, one of the most Marxist-dominated parts of the United Nations, so much so that the Americans and the British refused to finance it for a period. Do you realise they can now give the whole of the country away and they don't need to consult you? And that's the problem up in North Queensland. The tragedy is your state government has not fought this question on the fundamental principle. What they should have done was in essence say, right, this is unconstitutional, what you're doing, you just keep out of here, perhaps send, send a rich and back with a little better treatment than he got the last time, and make it clear that is that, and have a showdown. Or even do what Sir Joe once used to talk about, perhaps we'll talk about seceding out of this association, if that's the way we're going to be treated. But no, they're just negotiating. And the organisations which should be defending it, the National Farmers Federation, what, what do they say? You ought to have a look at this because we're going to have Mr Ian McLaughlin, the Federal Parliament soon. Some people think he's one of those white shining knights that's going to come on the stage and save it. What are they saying? They're saying the only disagreement we've got about what's going up there is the compensation terms are not good enough. Which in essence is saying we want better surrender terms. But they're not arguing about whether you should surrender or not. Surrender. They've got at least 100 areas now listed around Australia as potential areas for the world heritage. The wildflower areas in West Australia. And people argue about conservation. It's got nothing to do with conservation. It's got nothing to do with the rain tree forest. Nothing to do with the wildflowers in West Australia. It's got to do with how do you get power. And they've now got a means by which they can do it without consulting you. When Mr Gough Whitlam, a member of the Fabian Society, addressed one of the early Aboriginal national conferences, he said, don't worry about the local politicians here. Take this question to some of the world bodies because, you see, we've signed conventions concerning Aboriginal affairs. That's the source of power. He told them that. He was a man, our Prime Minister in essence, telling you bluntly about surrendering the country. And that's what it's all about. And we've got to understand that. Well, you need to say, get your mind around that part of the surrender, then we have another look at another part quickly. What some people call, I think very appropriately, the second Japanese invasion. Now, what's the significance of this? What's it all about? You can't understand this unless you see it as part of the global program, the struggle for world power. And Japan is one of the major, you might say, tools in the game. The Japanese lend themselves well to it. Just let's quickly look at their background. The Japanese are a Mongolian people who a long time ago invaded the islands now called Japan and displaced the original, the Aboriginal people, the Ainos, have got a pretty bad time. They lend themselves to the sort of discipline, the corporate state, 
and it's not without significance that Christianity's made a relatively little impact on the Japanese. Now, in view of that, with their value system, we shouldn't be surprised they acted as they did against Australian troops, prisoners of war. They're just reflecting their value system. They have no real value for individual life at all. That's the point to grab. So Japan, originally brought into the game, we need to remind ourselves of this, during the Second World War. And here's a piece of history, got to get this clear to understand this ongoing program. One of the great barriers to the drive for power on a global scale was the old British world because this was taking man in a different direction. That had to be broken up. No argument about that. It took two world wars, a Great Depression and what we're seeing now, to try and achieve that. The old British world. So we start back, first of all, to see the source of power. Now Japan emerged into the modern world, you might say, early this century with the conflict with Tsarist Russia. And at that stage, a very powerful man in the United States by the name of Jacob Schiff, the great German-Jewish international financier of the famous Kuhnleben Company, the same group that financed the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, he made a remarkable statement. He said those Russians have got to be given a lesson. And in essence, I'm going to use the Japanese to give them a lesson. And in order the Japanese can give them a lesson, they've got to be well equipped, so they'll need a navy. And I'll finance the navy. And he did, he extended a massive loan to the Japanese so they could get a navy. Now, the interesting is, he didn't extend the loan in dollars. The loan was in sterling, which in essence meant the British, that time, number one shipbuilders in the world, built the Japanese navy. Now, that shows you the power I'm talking about is above nations. It manipulates nations, it manipulates people. It sees people as merely the raw material for planning on a global scale. Well, as a result of that relationship between Britain and Japan, they developed something called the Anglo-Japanese Naval Agreement, which from the British point of view was an excellent idea. It ensured in the event of another war or any disturbances, the Far East would be relatively secure with this agreement with Japan, with a navy the British had built, with loans provided with Mr. Schiff, of course. And the Japanese adhered very strictly to that agreement. If you don't know it, you should know it. During the First World War, the Japanese Navy played a major role in convoying Australian troops to the European Wharf Theatre. There was complete stability in the Far East. The British didn't need to worry about that because of that agreement with Japan. But as a result of the First World War, the British came out of it completely in debt to the groups we're talking about. Power now was passing from the British to these groups. And the first thing they demanded was that agreement with the Japanese had to be torn up. And that was done shortly after the First World War. And that was a tremendous slap in the face to the Japanese. Face is terminally important with those people. And so the seeds of what was to come later were already being sown. This is the power we're talking about. We went into the Great Depression. We came up to the events that led to the Second World War. A war which was primarily designed to achieve a further advance of this program. Both the Soviet and Adolf Hitler's Germany had been financed. But the major target was the, the old British world. Now it's beyond dispute by 1941. The position as far as the British were concerned, we were concerned, was we either had to do one of two things. We could have continued with the conflict on our own and been ultimately beaten militarily, or try and reach some agreement with an alternative German government, and that was a possibility. Because you see, the major factor in all of this was the United States was not going to come into the conflict. 80% of the American people are completely opposed to it. So the great problem of the power grips how to bring. America into the conflict, to continue the conflict. That was the big question. Japan was the tool. A moderate government headed by Prince Kanoi was toppled. He nearly crawled to the Americans, would have done anything they wanted. Unheard of in Japanese history, this sort of attitude of face. 
No. With power, men wanted war. And so they applied an economic stranglehold on Japan. And as the Japanese moderate said, if you do that, we'll be collapsed. The military will take power and you'll have war. And we had Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor was conceived in Washington, not primarily in Tokyo. That immediately swept the United States into the war. You solved that problem overnight, didn't you? And at the end of the war, where were we all? Let's take Japan itself, bashed by the atomic bomb. Allegedly, the war with Japan had something to do with Manchuria. The Japanese had invaded Manchuria. They weren't supposed to be there, fair enough. But what happened to Manchuria? It was handed over to the Soviet Union without even consulting the Chinese or anywhere else. You see, the Japanese were simply part of the ongoing program. They've now been built up, modernised, financed, and away they go. And at that stage, then we have the first, next attack on the old British world. The British told you you've got to join something called the common market. Because this program for globalising power has a concept of first amalgamating nations into regional blocks so they can be then fitted into a final super block. It's all there. Read the literature. Our politicians apparently don't. The drive to get the British into the common market was inspired by these groups. And as one who lectured in Britain, I saw the problems because people wouldn't even believe, wouldn't even believe the document. The Treaty of Rome, as it's called, nothing to do with the Vatican, just signed in Rome. And people said, well, it, it can't mean that. This is just a sort of an economic arrangement. We're terribly sorry about the Australians and New Zealand break up our trading partnership. But, you know, it's only an economic arrangement. And to try and tell them the ultimate objective is to completely amalgamate you. Oh, look, sport, that just couldn't happen here, old chap. No, no, we play cricket here. That just couldn't happen. Well, now, of course, they've discovered it can happen. And step by step, they've been sucked into this. They were even sold the story, you know, that by joining the common market, that'd be a great barrier against the expansion of communism. But now, right as you meet here tonight, with this dramatic change, so-called change, in the Soviet Union, now it's proposed that the Soviet Union should be brought into the common market. We've got to integrate the economies more and more. And at this moment, a quite remarkable development's taken place. And that iron lady that's gone along with much of this, Mrs. Thatcher, suddenly says, well, the final step, which is due in 1992, We've got to have a common currency, the Financial Control Reserve Bank. My goodness, if we do that, we might as well close the British House of Commons down. And do you know what's happened? A remarkable development. The very press that used to praise Mrs Thatcher are now telling you she's a backward-looking old witch, she hasn't caught the vision of the future, and today's press reports, I see, said that amongst the great opponents of Margaret Thatcher are the big multinationals and the international bankers. In other words, she's got to go if she's going to take that attitude because Britain's got to be sucked right in. So you see, this is part of that ongoing program and Japan was used. And Japan's economy is used then as a battering ram against us. It's being used against America. It's part of the Trilateral Commission. Have you wondered, for example, why in Japan they have interest rates at only 3.5%? And you have 17, 18, and 19 percent. You think that's just a bit of bad luck? Perhaps they're a bit more far-sighted up there. This is all part of the total program. You see, what the Japanese are doing is doing much better than we are able to do. And I just want to say a few words on this because it's got to be said they're mastering the subject of black magic a bit better than we are, and are being used to drive it harder. Now, part of black magic, of course, tells us that. One of the things we've got to do if we're going to hold on in this country is we've got to have uh, the investment of Japanese yen. That's the first thing. And the Japanese, you see, got a lot of yen because they've got a lot of export credits because they work harder than you do. They're disciplined more. And so they've got a lot of yen. Now, presumably, if we don't get those yen, my friends, we've had it. So I've got to raise the question. I am raising it. If we don't face this question, you've got no defence at all. This is not a question of physical defence. The physical defence that we undertook back 
in 41, 42, 43 was relatively easy because we understood the nature of the problem. But now the problem's very difficult because the problem's in their own minds now. And the witch doctors of orthodox finance have convinced us if you don't have those yen here, you really can't get this country on its feet. So therefore we've got to have high interest rates, otherwise they won't send the yen here. In fact, an even more dreadful thing could happen. There could be a flight of capital out of the country. Now, that's a dreadful thing to contemplate, isn't it? And have you ever wondered what that means? Have you ever asked yourself, well, what do we get when we get this yen? What are they sending us here? The black magic, of course, masks the fact they don't send us anything except now little electronic blips. And apparently if we don't play the game and don't have high interest rates to get the blips here, they might send the blips somewhere else. Do we believe that? Do we accept that? Well, I want to tell you, my friends, quickly, during the first Japanese invasion, we didn't accept that at all. Perhaps we were a different breed of people. Perhaps we saw things a little differently. Because in the year 1941, we brought to office in this government, in this country, one of those old-time Labour governments. Now, please, may I just say this? When I talk about Labour governments, I'm not talking about this present bunch of uh, Fabians and academics and pseudo-intellectuals. I'm speaking about the old-time Labour Party. With all its faults and had many, I criticise them. But at least they are Australian patriots. They, weren't, they were nationalists, they weren't internationalists. And there was one of them, John Curtin, who'd got some understanding of this black magic. And in essence said, well, listen, if a thing is physically possible, we've got to make it financially possible. And that concept swept this country. And that's the sort of movement that hopefully can be developed in this country again, from the grassroots. It was a tremendous movement. You can read the literature of the period. Resolutions in your state parliaments. The first one started in South Australia. Moved by a chap called Mr. Bill McGilray. You may be amazed to hear this. He was the, the leader or one of the chief spokesmen for 17 independents. Can you imagine? At the moment we're told that independents can't do anything. Don't even think about them. They used to elect independents in those days. 17 of them. And Bill McGillaray gave an address in which he put his finger on real powers used by international bankers. In fact, the language he used, I want to tell you, was that old, rugged, manly language that Australians once used. In fact, if Bill McGillaray were alive today and gave that speech, he'd be before the Race Relations Board. Al Grasby would nearly have a fit. They were men. And that resolution was carried. We've got to put this country on a full war effort by making finance available. We can't let symbols stand in the way of the war effort. Carried by the West Australian Parliament, the Tasmanian Parliament, and if you're interested, your own Queensland Parliament carried that resolution. Might be interesting, someone goes to the records and read what they said. They'd seen a bit through the black magic. The 1940 elections brought Con John Curtin within two votes of winning. The balance of power was virtually held by one man, a chap called Alec Wilson, the independent country party member for the Mallee Victoria. Alec Wilson was part of that movement. I knew him well as a boy, young man. And I well recall, I'll never forget, it's part of my own life story. The night that I walked out of Dunkling's The Jewelers in Burke Street, where I'd just bought my wife to be an engagement ring, cool September evening, and I ran into Alec Wilson. After the usual congratulations, we got down to the serious business. Well, Alec, what's going to happen? We can't go on the way we're going. The war clouds are now starting in the north. The Japanese threat was cl clear. What are we going to do? Well, he said, I'll tell you, Eric, we've got no hope until we shift the government. At least Kurt and a few of them got some understanding, and I tell you, in a couple of weeks, the coalition's finished. Curtin's going to come to office. And he did. There was a dramatic improvement in the situation. Suddenly finance was available. The economy of this country was almost revolutionised overnight. The wheat growers are on the, almost on the verge of revolution suddenly discovered that wheat growing was profitable. Not only the primary industry, secondary industry. Wheat started to do things we'd never done in this country before. And anybody that served in the New Guinea campaign will recall almost with reverence when you, you know, you really should bow down when a piece of technology turned up there that would actually work in the mud and slush. 
and like the Thompsons and the other machine guns, it all seemed to jam. Something called the Owen submachine gun would work. It not only would work in the mud and slush, you could fire it under water. Where did it come from? It was the result of a bit of good old-fashioned Aussie resourcefulness. A young Australian in the backyard produced that submachine gun. And how did we manufacture it? Did someone suggest we need to get some yen from the Japanese? We can't do anything or borrow anywhere else? No, we did it ourselves. We used Australian steel. We tooled up Australian factories, Australian workmen, fed by their fellow Australians, living in houses built by Australians. That's how it was done. We went on, we manufactured bow for guns, tank carriers, and eventually, before the war was finished, we were even manufacturing a plane which at that time was in world class, the Wirraway. And was all being financed here in Australia. Yes, there were defects, but it was done here in Australia by Australia. And so the first Japanese invasion was beaten off because we had a grasp of some aspects of reality. The second one succeeding because now we're the victims of this black magic. And until we free ourselves from that, my friends, all we can do is keep on giving the country away. And after the financial economic invasion, then comes the cultural invasion. And we as a people will simply go backwards. These are all manifestations of program of surrender. And so Mr. Bob Hawke stands up in some part of Asia and says, well, we're all part of the world now. And that wretched immigration policy we had, that's all gone. You can all come now, everybody can come. Which means, of course, that what happens to traditional Australia? All I'm going to say on the multicultural business, one of the greatest hoax of all time. And one of the strongest opponents of the second Japanese invasion I've ever heard is herself of Japanese background. You see, she's one of the 700 Japanese war brides that came out here. Young Australians did marry a number of Japanese girls. This girl became a Christian. She's grown up in the Australian way of life. My kids are Australian. I've freed, I've, I've escaped from that. That's an awful type of society. It's an awful sort of culture. And now Mr. Hawke says he'd like to see it all come here. Or the other person that I've been listening to a lot recently is a very great Australian, also warning on the same thing. He's a great Australian and he's a black Australian. In fact, he's one of the genuine Aboriginal, the Reverend Cedric Jacob. He's not one of these Earth's art types that just stayed out in the sun a bit too long, got brown. He's a genuine Aboriginal, but he's a Christian. <coughs> and he's uh, very pleased the Europeans came here. He's very pleased with the British. He likes the system of law. And he's been lecturing on the multicultural oaks. He said, it's taken my people about 200 years to come to grips with this new culture, which I think has lifted our people up and given us a chance. Now, he said, without even consulting us, you want to bring a dozen different other cultures in. How are we going to cope with this? And of course, we won't be able to cope with it. All part of the planned surrender of Australia. And you're not supposed to have a say on this. All the parties now tell you the immigration's off the agenda. It's all been decided for you. All part of surrendering this country. So as we come to an end, you say, well, where do we go? What are we going to do? That's the $64 question. What are we going to do about any of these issues? Well, we can do absolutely nothing till we go back to those absolutes I'm talking about and agree on a few fundamentals. Number one is that the individual's the starting point. There's inviolable rights. There are absolutes concerning governments and the structure of government and governments belong to us. We don't belong to governments. They belong to us, to serve us. Now, it's obvious that the system that we did inherit is progressively undermined. The only the politicians, not even all the politicians agree or disagree. They will admit privately that we don't count anymore. There's no such thing as parliamentary democracy. We don't have a free deliberative assembly where we get up and make laws. Our only role now is to go in, and not often do we all go in, and even to get a quorum, and we just put our hands up to agree to things that have been made by other people. We don't even have time to read it all. And I've met them. I met a National Party member the other night, or a couple of weeks back down in New South Wales. He admitted he had signed or agreed to a piece of legislation he never read and he didn't understand. It was pointed out to him. Oh, well, he said, of course, you can't read everything. It's 
So what happens is one of the experts in our party said it's a jolly good idea and we said that's right George, we put our hands up and legalised, that's all. I was just looking at the last hands that's come to me, in one day in the Senate, 12 pieces of legislation. Do you really think that your so-called representatives understand what's going on? They've been giving this country away by signing conventions they don't even understand. That silly senator of yours, Ron Boswell, doesn't even know his party was the one that signed that convention concerning the, the World Heritage List. It wasn't Bob Hawke at all. Didn't even know it. It's only that wretched League of Rights that made all this up. Well, what are we going to do? We've got to get control back. Now, when our constitution was being prepared, our forebears looked around the world, the American system, Canadian system, but it's very interesting, they looked at that little country we call Switzerland. Because you see, from about the beginning, middle of last century, Switzerland was evolving a very interesting constitutional system of government. The three major, of course, language culture groups in Switzerland, German speaking, French speaking, Italian speaking. Most of the power is decentralised, back with the cantons, the federal government has the minimum power. And this constitutional development insisted that the people should have the right to veto legislation they don't like, laws they don't like, and they can do it. How do they do it? All they've got to do is enough of them are concerned enough, you petition, you demand a referendum. And if, for example, there's a piece of legislation about taxation, we don't like that, you demand a say. Perhaps that explains why Switzerland's got one of the lowest tax rates in the world. Might explain why they got an inflation rate of only 1%. And what about immigration? They don't have any problems about immigration in Switzerland. Because if you want to become a citizen of Switzerland, you've got to be accepted by the people in the local canton where you're going to live. This is the point that Reverend Cedric Jacobs makes as a Christian. If you've got a home, the family's there. Don't they all have a say who's going to come in the door? You don't just throw the door open and say, anybody can come in. Those of you are responsible about your kids. Your daughter's going to get married, your son married. Don't you want to know where the person they're going to marry comes from? Don't you want to have a look at them? Don't you want to know a little about their background? That's what Cedric Jacobs says. We are members of our na nation home. We should all have a say. In Switzerland, they do have a say, so they don't have any problems. Oh, yes, they have the workers there from other countries. When they've fulfilled their contract, they all go home again. In the same way, I've got no objection to Japanese tourists coming here. I think it's a good idea. They want to come here and have a look at us, but then I think they all should go home again. I don't think they should be mid take the country over. See, the Swiss have got the power in the hands of the people. International agreements, for example, nearly three years ago, the proposal they should join the United Nations. People are staggered to hear that. A country's not a member of that holy of holies. How have they got on? Well, they've got on very well. It was proposed they should join. Now, any international treaty in Switzerland of indefinite period must go to the people. So the people had a say. And what did they say? 70% said no. 70% said no. Does anybody disagree with the idea it'd be nice if we had a say occasionally about something? That's what this is all about. That idea was looked at by our forebears, but they said we really won't need it here because we're going to have a say. But that say's been taken from us. So what we've got to do is to get the say back again. And the Swiss concept is certainly the way to go. Let it be adopted. Bring it into our constitution. Start at the state level. Elect candidates that are pledged to bring it in. Insist the people must have a say. Perhaps we might have a referendum on whether we'd like the Swiss system. Perhaps the people might say we don't think it's a good idea. But at least, for goodness sake, let us have a say. And that's what this movement's about. And all the League of Rights has done is to encourage this idea. But the critics of the League are suddenly alarmed. It's the League of Rights. The League of Rights is not engaged in the power game. We're a service movement. We're encouraging people to do things for themselves. And that seems to have terrified politicians. But those jolly peasants out there might get these quaint ideas that they're entitled to have a say. Where will it finish? They might even want lower interest rates, lower taxes, 
might want us out of the United Nations, might want some of those international conventions torn up. You can't have that. Well, we've got to make up our minds whether we're going to have a say or whether you're going to continue. Just let the country go the way it's going. So the League, therefore, as I see it, Mr Chairman, is being assaulted and attacked because it's been the one movement which consistently has put together a body of knowledge and understanding with expertise. Now, I happen to be in possession of an assessment of the campaign against the League. I tell you, Senator Boswell wouldn't be very flattered by what they say. They said he must be one of the most useful idiots that's ever stumbled into our path and some of the others. This has been a manipulated program, not against the League of Rights as such, because what can they do to the League? They can't affect our voting pattern because we're not running for votes. We're not in the popularity stakes. But so what's the purpose of it all? The purpose is to try and frighten people, if they can out there, don't listen to any of those ideas or advice that you're getting from that movement called the League of Rights. That's the real purpose of the campaign. It can't affect the League, but it can, if people listen to it, affect other people. Now, fortunately, slowly but surely, people are seeing through this. Slowly but surely, they're beginning to realise that here is a program which they can adapt themselves in their own communities, in their own movements, and slowly but surely, we can start to turn this country around again. And that's where we are at the moment. You're going to say, well, have you got some nice, neat blueprint before you sit down? I haven't. What I've got and can only say to you is what I suppose was the position that faced our pioneering forebears that went out into this vast, empty country. And what did they have? Well, they had one thing, they had a tremendous faith in themselves and their fellows. They had a faith in the institutions and the stream of ideas that had been brought here from overseas. That's what they had. In the same way, the men at Gallipoli, what do they have except faith? Or those that held the line in the Owen Stanleys and all the rest? Faith. Without a clear understanding of how you're going to reach the end of the road, but you sustain yourself by faith, rooted in these absolutes we've been talking about. And so I want to conclude, Mr Chairman, by expressing my faith. I believe we as a nation are better equipped with our resources, our history and everything else to show the rest of the world there's a way to go, a better way to go. How we're going to do it, we'll evolve that as we go along. But the starting point, at least, is to kindle the faith, sustain the faith and continue to go back to those absolutes all the time. And if we do this, I'm quite sure we can pass to our kids and to our grandkids that heritage which our forebears passed to us. Thank you very much. There's no easy answer to that question, which of course is a very fundamental question. What we are witnessing is of course a program emerging, but perhaps at this stage I should say something that I think is most important to say, that this program is never ever going to succeed. The reason it's not going to succeed is so contrary to reality that as the program proceeds, you're going to, so far from reaching more and more central control, you're going to produce what you're getting in the Soviet Union and in communist China, there's going to be a breakup. There's going to be a progressive breakup. In fact, the real threat to us is not the program will ever come to fruition. The real threat is that our social structure under the pressure of that program will disintegrate. And you see the manifestation of that today. The League of Rights' view has always been we've got to take the long view. I'm philosophical. I don't think there's any good getting ulcers about it. Retain your sense of humour. You with that accent obviously come from a place that got a sense of humour. 
That's the greatest weapon we've got. And we've got to take that long view. The great majority of our fellows only move under the pressure of events. They don't move under the pressure of explanations. But when they do decide to move, if you've got a coherent movement that's there, that does understand, at that stage, then your fellows will take notice. They will ask for advice. And that's the stage we're now reaching. And so I can tell you the League of Rights gets more and more requests to give us advice, give us help, what would you do about this? And we're doing that all the time. And we've got to take, therefore, that long view in the battle. And I appreciate the point you've made as far as, beyond doubt, incidentally, the greatest Governor General I think we've ever had in this country, Sir William Slim. He was a man's man. He was a soldier's man. He demonstrated the value of that sort of leadership, which I did indicate you'll find first outlined 2,000 years ago, which said that he'd be the greatest among you, got to be the servant of them all. That's the sort of leadership we want in this country. We don't want a lot of people with ego trips. We don't want a lot of people to think they're the, the end and all of all the problems we got, jumping into parties and all that. We want Australians back here at the grassroots prepared to come forward to offer to serve their fellows. But they've got to have a volume of knowledge and understanding. All I can say is the League is trying to provide that and judging by the sort of attacks on us by our enemies, this is the th one thing that they fear. Now that's the best short answer I can give you. They want to make them like that? Well, in essence, if you'll read, you mentioned Jeff McDonald's book. It's on the table there, Red Over Black. Incidentally, the story of Jeff McDonald's worth just recording. Jeff McDonald, the former top communist, uh, as a young student inside the communist conspiracy had seen and understood the way in which uh, it was proposed to manipulate the indigenous people of this country not for their benefit but to destroy the country his big problem was no one would listen to him it was too silly for words he went to all the parties including the liberal party and it wasn't until the league of rights examined this we provided him not only with a publisher we provide him with a platform and there's no argument in 1984 he had a tremendous impact in this country so much so the federal government did something quite unprecedented they uh brought they, they caught they called in mr ken gott the top five and paid him fifty five thousand dollars to research the league of rights now what he was saying was of course that the the aboriginal people are simply seen as pawns in a bigger game and they would have been destroyed as much as the original the Aboriginal people in Japan were overwhelmed by the invading Mongolian people. There's very few of the Anos people left in Japan, and those that do remain, they regard as very second-class citizens. Anybody who knows the Japanese situation knows that. Very difficult to give you a short answer, an adequate answer, except to say this, that the Australia Act in the long haul of history, obviously, has weakened our situation in this country. I think the most disturbing aspect of the Australia Act is that you had a lot of politicians around this country who put their hands up and voted for it. And if you talk to them privately and get down to the nitty grit later, they'll admit they didn't know anything about or what it was about or what was involved. That is part of the problem we're facing. And you've got to understand that. So it's not only the Australia Act, there's many other things some of you heard or met uh, beyond doubt the greatest Austra Australian authority on these international treaties is Dr. David Mitchell and incidentally I understand he's writing a book and he's pointed out that you'll find it impossible to get a complete list or very difficult to get a complete list of everything that's been signed and as for asking a politician what he's agreed to he have, wouldn't have a clue that's part of the problem I well recall it not only applies in this country, it's all over the world. When I was in Canada shortly after this great start of the revolution of our constitution, I was telling Canadians at a meeting way up Dawson's Creek, which is up towards Alaska, about what had happened and the way this thing in Tasmania developed. And they all looked at me in amazement and said, we thought you were Australians, are pretty resourceful people. We just can't get our minds around the fact you'd surrender part of your country. Well, just by chance, I'd been in the library of the public building before, and I looked at a whole series on the wall there of Canada's major national parks, 
And lo and behold, I see there in black and white, they'd all been put under the same central control years before. And those Canadians nearly fell down. I said, we never knew anything about that. Well, I said, perhaps we'll ask the first Canadian Federal Member of Parliament. We asked him. He couldn't remember that either. You see, this is part of what's taking place in the world today. The Swiss are in the position they can't do that, at least to the Swiss. The people can have a say there. You can't sign international agreement without having a say. So the Australia Act, yes, bad news, but it's just an example of the way we're going. The retreat that's taking place is taking place on all fronts. And I've touched only the major aspects of the retreat. We can look at a number of other areas. We can look, for example, you have mentioned uh, the cultural aspect, tremendously important. That takes us to what's called our educational system. We've been progressively retreating on that front for years. Our kids are coming out of this system with the most incredible ideas. Young people are very vulnerable, you know. And at the moment, you know, compared with a few years ago, the great threat, the great fear was the bomb was going to drop. We don't hear any more about the bomb. Now something called the ozone, that's the terrifying thing, and everybody's going around all talking about the ozone threat. All the kids, they're getting taught in schools about this, this special material issue. All I'm going to say tonight is another manifestation of a great hoax designed to condition us so we'll accept more centralised control. Yes, peace studies are all designed to convince the young people, yes, that we can all live together in peace and brotherness with everybody. Uh, Everybody's just the same, we're all equal. And so it's all part of that softening up. So, yes, ideas are, of course, preceding the economic aspect, but they're also proceeding at the same time as the economic collapse and retreat is taking place. So you'd need, you could write a whole thesis on different manifestations of that retreat. Our problem, therefore, is to try and get this into some sort of perspective. It's a question of informing people, but most important of all is to give them hope. That's what people are lacking at the moment, hope. You don't need, Mr Chairman, at the moment to convince 80% of Australians they've got problems, they, they feel that. What they're all looking around for is, well, what can we do? Can you do anything? If they're convinced you can do nothing, well, perhaps it's better to surrender to Big Brother. Perhaps Big Brother will be kindly and nice. He'll be a different kind of Big Brother and we can all live together. This is taking place at the moment. So we've got to give them hope and we've got to do that by giving them a means whereby they can do something. And I've not met any people yet outside party politicians who disagree with the idea of us having something like the Swiss system, of having a say. That's the key. Then we'll start to lift the the name of the game a bit. But regretfully, I think Christians themselves have really got to get their own act together and develop a bit more mental muscle. Instead of, in many cases, I'm not saying my friend's doing this because I know where he's come from, but we have all these trite statements turned out as if that solves your problem, such as, for example, we all should engage in prayer. Now, prayer is a tremendous thing. But I'm one of those Christians that believe the real purpose of going down on your knees and prayer is so you can get up and fight. I think if you stay on your knees, you might find yourself being rather massacred because there are people that don't take much notice of prayer. There's a chap called St James who did make a very pertinent observation to the effect that faith without works is death. We must have works. We must have action. That means we've got to get down to programs. The absolute is, of course, what we call God. It's not God that's punishing us. We're punishing ourselves. If you're going to jump over the cliff all the time, it's not God. He's created the law of gravity. He didn't push you over. You're silly enough to think you can jump over without paying a price. Every time we violate absolutes, we've got to pay a price. It all depends when you've had enough and say, right, you're going to stop doing that or do something more sensible. And that's the way we've got to look at it. Otherwise, again, we'll have long disputations amongst Christians about all sorts of, uh, to me, uh, matters that, while are important to some people, are not going to unify us on the basic issues that I think we've got to come together on, and that's the way I see it.